Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Makuk P. Salem podcast series for the, that also will accompany our fourth publication of the Indigenous Business Magazine that we're very excited uh, to be launching the first week of December. Super excited to have our partners and sponsors um, here with us today from Gowling WLG, more specifically um, Bob Friedman, who we'll be talking to in just a moment um, about Indigenous uh, partnerships and, um, and his company's role and his role specifically um, in working with Indigenous communities. Gowling WLG is home to one of the largest and most respected Indigenous law practices in Canada. Since the 1950s, Gowling WLG has been at the forefront of Indigenous law in Canada, working alongside First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples in landmark self-government agreements, resource development projects, and Supreme Court cases. Bob Friedman joined Gowling WLG's Indigenous Law Group as a partner in the firm's Vancouver office in July of this year. With nearly 30 years of experience working in Indigenous law, his practice focuses on treaty negotiations, negotiations outside of formal treaty processes, regulatory and duty to consult related work, environmental assessments, and the negotiation of complex agreements involving Indigenous people, industry, and government. Welcome, Bob. Thank you so much for making some time to be with us today. Thanks very much, Justin. Um, we'll just get right into it because I'm super excited about having this discussion with you. Um, and I know that our listeners are going to be um, also listening carefully to lots of the insight that you bring over your 30 year career, as well as um, the company that you're representing. So what are some of the key developments in the law related to Indigenous peoples in the last 30 years that have led to the changes in the relationship between industry and Indigenous communities? So thanks for the question. I just want to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking from downtown Vancouver on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil First Nations. In terms of your question, and you smile when you said 30 years, I don't know whether to smile or shudder, but it, it goes pretty quickly. I think the biggest difference I've seen is when I started practicing, and even when I went to law school in the late 80s and early 90s, there wasn't a lot of positive interaction, in my view, between industry and First Nations. And I think what started to change it are just certain developments in the law. So in BC, as your listeners probably know, there aren't that many treaties that were signed. So there's a lot of legal uncertainty. And starting in the 90s, but really the late 90s, there were duty to consult cases. So basically, where there's any project that could affect Indigenous rights, culture, or way of life, government, whether it's BC, Canada, or both, have to consult. And there was a case in the late 90s called Halfway River. It was a Treaty 8 case. But as I recall, it was the first case that really put a stop to a project for failure of consultation. And again, I, I can't presume what industry was thinking, but I think there's sort of two related pieces to the case law. One is where there's legal uncertainty at least for more progressive companies at the time, the message I think was go work with affected indigenous groups. We don't want to rely on governments doing the right thing or the wrong things. So let's just work together and see if we can sort issues out. And the other one, which is related is what I like to term leverage. It sounds a little bit crass, but where you have legal uncertainty, more rights being recognized on the part of Indigenous nations, they have more potential leverage. Um, but, and I'm sure we'll get to it in some of your other questions, 
it still took a lot of time for companies and certainly not all of them to start catching up that First Nations are not impediments, they can be helpful partners. So I'll I'll stop there. But I think it's really, it was changes in the case law that really started to give, in some ways, more guidance, but created enough uncertainty to do things. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, the assessment of companies seeing uh, Indigenous communities and peoples and leaders as, uh, you know, um, good partners, um, other than being risk adverse or impediments to economic development, that is certainly shifted um, over time. I don't know if we're fully, if everyone's fully there yet, but we're definitely shifting the dial to um, change the narrative there. Um, so, you know, to, to build on what you just said, uh, my next question is, how has industry behavior evolved since you started working in this area 30 years ago? So you've already sort of talked about some of that um, in, in your answering the first question. And how have you and your company been contributing to this evolution? I think the answer to that question really depends which province or territory we're talking about. Um, so let's start with the obvious. Let's start with BC. When I started practicing, so I was an articling student in 90, 1993, not 1893, 1993, and then I got called to the bar in 94. A lot of companies did not want to do deals with First Nations. So even the idea of an impact benefit agreement was largely foreign to them. I think the view, and I heard it, and it was pretty negative. Some fairly senior people in industry talked about this being a hold up or a ransom, that somehow having to do deals with First Nations was a bad thing. Um, there was that. And quite frankly, in some other provinces and territories, there are still parts of that. You know, your point that it's evolving positively, but by no means is it universal, I think is very, very true. But I think where I've seen the change, so when you start 28 and a half years ago, it was very negative, very hard to get deals. Then the evolution started to be some form of impact benefits agreement. So you would try and figure out what the potential impact of a project was, whether on its own or people have probably heard the word cumulative impact. So if you look at a territory, how does this project contribute to what's already going on? Um, I think for a long time, and I still do impact benefit agreements, and basically that financial component, there's a lot of environmental, but I think what's starting to change is the move to more equity participation. And even with equity, there's sort of what I call not real equity and real equity. So not real equity is you call something equity, but you're essentially doing yearly payouts without nations having any direct stake in a project. Then there's what's called real equity. So a number of years ago, I was working for the Miccosoo Cree First Nation in Alberta, and there was a lot of oil sands development. And Miccosoo negotiated a deal with Suncor and also with another First Nation to become 49% equity owners in what's called an East Tank Farm. Don't ask me what tank farms do other than they're related to the production of bitumen. But that deal, and I, I played part of a role. There are other people that played more role than I did. But what that did was the nations worked with Suncor and banks to basically float a bond. They have much larger upside and more risk. They're insiders in terms of the board for this tank farm. But I think the biggest evolution is moving from nothing to IBAs, to equity and name only, to nations actually 
doing the same commercial deals, Aboriginal people doing the same deals as anyone else. And I think in terms of our, of our firm's role, you know, as you mentioned, we've been doing this work for 60 years. Um, in Quebec, um, the firm has acted for the James Bay Cree for decades. Out here, we've acted for various nations. So I'd like to say we've been at the forefront of this work. Certainly by no means the only firm that is, but certainly one of the ones that's played a lead role. Yes, I agree. Um, over 60 years is a long time and uh, and working across the country on, you know, some precedent setting um, projects with communities as well, like the James Bay Cree are doing, you know, the hydro project they have there and other things that are, they've been moving forward is, is certainly exciting. Um, so I'm interested in hearing from you, from your perspective, what do you see are still the challenges between companies and Indigenous communities working together? I think one of the big, there's two big potential impediments. One is depending on what the province or territory is, and I'll single out Saskatchewan as one of the problems because I have a lot of clients there, where a government doesn't, I think it's fair to say, respect in a proper way Indigenous peoples, they then develop consultation policies that are narrow and I think legally problematic. Industry then says, well, we'll only do what the government says. So you have, quite frankly, companies in Alberta, the same company, and I'm not saying Alberta is the best jurisdiction in the world, although it's improved, where they will interact with First Nations, they totally understand what they need to do. You literally go 500 meters to the east into Saskatchewan, and companies will say, we don't have to do anything. The same company, the same officials. So I think one of the impediments is the view and the behavior of government, not Indigenous government. The second one is, and I think it's related, but slightly different, there are still too many companies that still have some version of, we don't have to, this is ransom. There are a lot of companies that are really progressive that don't wait for government direction. They just, they've had relationships for decades with Indigenous people. But, you know, one sector that I found problematic, because I also do work in the Yukon, for example, is junior mining companies. So junior mining companies will do a certain amount of work. They don't understand that they have to provide capacity funding, forget even an agreement, funding for First Nations, Indigenous groups to review what they're doing. They sort of claim they have no money, yet they had enough money to do work. So I find with smaller companies, if you take the government not really directing them, plus whatever views they may have, those I think are the two impediments. Impacts are impacts. Doesn't mean they're all the same, but you know, when you look at sort of big projects, companies that are progressive and will fund a lot of review work for First Nations are in way better position because they have an active player at the table. But companies that don't keep expecting nations to have all kinds of other issues, all kinds of other financial problems to somehow magically find money that doesn't exist. That's another big risk and impediment when it doesn't happen in terms of the funding. Yeah, I I agree um, on that assessment for sure. I think that uh, you know the first one that you bring up is it has a, a lot of influence, like non-indigenous governments and how they work with indigenous communities and and their views. I think that has a lot to do with um, you know influencing and sort of guiding industry along the way. Um, and the other two certainly are, are, are impediments still as well. I was just going to add. Yes, please. I'll, I'll forget Go it for later. It. Another Go big for development, it. and it's certainly happening or starting to happen in BC. So I think I said earlier, 
there was sort of not much consultation law, then some that created this uncertainty and leverage. In BC, more and more, we're moving in part to shared decision making. And shared decision making, at least when it works well, means that nations, well, they don't have full consent. Although in some places they do now. There's this thing in BC, um, it's called the DRIPA Act to implement UNDRIP, has what are called Section 7 agreement provisions that do give consent. But the basic point is more and more governments aren't just consulting. Like consultation never works. Governments push through what they want to do. Shared decision making, whether it's recommendations that are binding, whether it means that where or someone's going to make a decision, there's criteria for the decision. Um, that's also playing a huge role. Because if I was a lawyer advising industry with the uncertainty, with more and more move to shared decision making, it seems the, the best way to work to get your projects is to go directly to one of the people who's sharing in decisions. And I'm also a big advocate, although I did court work the first part of my career, working things out outside a courtroom between industry and First Nations, Indigenous peoples has to be the way to go. Yeah. Agreed. So you had, you're already anticipating my next question here. What are some best practices that companies can follow when establishing partnerships with Indigenous communities? And you did talk about shared decision making um, as, you know, as holding that up as what I would see as a best practice moving forward. Are there other things that you see that companies can follow uh, when establishing partnerships that would help, um, you know, just move things along would help smooth out some of the edges those types of things absolutely so i think it starts with early on establishing contact directly with the leadership of indigenous groups at least starting there like look at who the decision makers are whether the decision makers are a chief of council, whether it's hereditary, sometimes it's a combination. And it's not, it can be tricky, I understand that. But coming in, not basically saying, like coming in early before you formulate a decision. Obviously you can't do that until sort of commercially you're at a point where you can. But sitting down and describing the project especially for bigger ones saying, we'd like to work with you on the design of impact studies, environmental assessment work. Don't come in as many companies do saying, we'd like to work with you, but sorry, we've spent a decade doing the studies without talking to you. I think that's the first thing. Don't just come in to get a check mark from government. Actually find out who you're working with, what, how they view the world. I think that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, as I talked about earlier, capacity funding, especially for larger projects. Don't come in and plead poverty or tell Indigenous groups, well, you can apply for public funding. So we, well, we've spent millions of dollars on our own tech people or hiring them out. You can have $40,000 of public Fund it. It's ridiculous. On big projects, the costs are hundreds of thousands of dollars to equip nations to hire experts, whether their own or others, to work with the community, financial people. So a lot of it's the upfront work. Then I would say, in terms of best practices, work early on on sort of a relationship agreement, basically try and troubleshoot what the issues are going to be if you're going through a regulatory process. But the earlier you can figure out, you being industry, whether you want to make deals, and not all of them do, cut to the chase and start getting there. 
don't just make it in reality or appearance that you want to work together, but this is an exercise in box ticking to look like you've done the right thing. My clients can see through that in a moment. And I think for most, obviously, I would never presume to speak for all Indigenous nations. They're all, everyone's different. But a lot of the nations I work with want to be part of deals. I mean, it depends on the impact. Like, they're not going to be part of deals that run through their rights, culture, and way of life. They need good jobs. They need income flowing into the nations. They want their own source revenue and not be dependent on government. So there's a lot of alignment that can happen. And I think the other best practice, both for Indigenous groups and industry, don't rely heavily on government to guide the process. The more that industry and Indigenous groups can work together, for, especially for sophisticated companies and nations, we've all seen all the places where problems can develop. So if industry can work with indigenous groups to troubleshoot and work their way through, a lot of the normal arguing about process, you can do away with and focus on the real issues. Yeah, that's some great, really great advice, Bob. I think about best practices and starting early and establishing a relationship and you know, a relationship agreement and like shared decision making. And yeah, I think that that, um, you know, when, when I've seen that in, in my work that, you know, there's like that sort of goodwill that's built up front and you're, and you're establishing that relationship and that, Hey, like we are, there is, this isn't going to be easy. (laughs) We're likely going to have disagreements, And then before you get to that conflict or to those disagreements, you've already established like a relationship protocol and how we're going to work through this, right? Which doesn't work all the time, but at least you are starting to like, you know, establish those protocols up front, which I think is so important. And don't treat relationship as we're going to go and find out who the influential elders are and basically go and try and see if you can separate people and go behind people's backs. Because my clients also, in a second, can tell whether a company is genuine, whether they show respect, or whether this is all about playing games. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that um, Indigenous communities are are very astute at Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that there's been so much of that over the 150 plus years that uh that they you're oh, right they'll have, have, unfortunately yeah. They'll have yeah. yeah yeah they can sniff it out I think like a mile away so definitely I think that's some great advice and you you know we, we've been talking about you being like uh, over 30 years in the industry the best practices that you outlined here are you know obviously um things that you've learned along the way with your clients. Uh, And so, you know, to build on, on some of the wisdom that you've shared here, what has been one or two of the biggest lessons that you personally have learned in your career working with Indigenous peoples and communities? It's an ongoing piece of learning. In terms of working with my clients, trying to figure out how to communicate as best I can, because I'm not Indigenous and there's all kinds of things, even doing this for a long time, that I'll never be proficient at. Trying to figure out how as best I can to ensure that what I'm saying is being understood. I find a lot of my clients are incredibly respectful they may be nodding yes. And I've learned over time, nodding yes may mean yes or not yes. So part of it is when I've worked with the same people for decades, I think I've learned some of that. I think another thing is every community that I work in, figure out how they want to be communicated with, whether in some communities, starting with protocol, starting with what their customs are in others, it's different. But don't go in, in my case, as some 
lawyer, arrogant lawyer, figure out how the community, how to work with the community, I think is a critical one. The other thing sort of looking at industry is basically keeping focus on the kinds of best practices that we talked about. And, you know, my view is this is all about relationships. It's about relationships with my own clients. It's relationships with industry. There are times, as you said earlier, where there's going to be conflict. But I think for all of this, establishing the fact that we're human beings, that people are more likely in their own systems to work harder when there's a common respect. Don't go in pounding the table. That doesn't work. I mean, be stand up where you need to for your clients. That's part of advocacy. But if there's relationship building that can be done with folks from industry, I think the biggest eye opener to me was when I started, with especially with big companies, you know, mainly dealing with engineers who didn't no disrespect completely to engineers. They weren't really folk. They knew the technical side, but didn't understand the indigenous side. And I would say over the years, you know, second to my relationships with clients is there's some great people in the industry who really want to do great things. The more that you can figure that out and build the relationships, the better. And when they don't want to do that, then we fight with each other if we have to. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's very insightful. Uh, just like, you know, you're talking about like approach coming in, you know, with some humility, recognizing that many Indigenous groups are come from a relational culture, right? So that we center relationships over, um, you know, law and and <laughs> and policies and all of that, right? Like so many of our communities will, yeah, want want to really know who you are before we start diving into business. Like who are you and where are you from? And do you have kids? And exactly. you know, like that, like it's like that's important, you know, to many of Indigenous peoples when we're going into their communities and and wanting to work long term. And so that's great um, insight that that you can share here. And I have one final question for you, um, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to your answer to this. Is what would your vision be for partnerships and revenues revenue sharing agreements with companies and indigenous communities moving forward? I think I sort of touched on it a bit earlier, and it does depend on the size of the project. But I think what I call true equity where this isn't where basically my clients take a certain amount of risk for a much larger upside where you're working commercially with banks and financial people that it isn't just a made up deal where such and such company is going to pay out x amount you call it equity but it's really an iba and again not to say that that any client would take that, of course, over nothing. But I think the more my clients have a stake in things, I think it changes the relationship because they're in the same position as folks from industry. They have the same risk. When you're talking about even things like jobs, contracts, it's from a position of equality. It's not from a position of one side holds all the power. And I think. Your, the mind gets much more focused when you have liability for a bond, you better make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. And I guess I, I, I lied. One more question for you is just, is there anything else that you'd like to, to add that, you know, maybe I haven't asked that just as we're going through this, you know, this conversation that, um, there hasn't been space for just wanting to to put that out there for you. I think the only other thing I would say is, I think this is a very exciting time. I think as we move from the 30 year ago to more and more, we're talking business equity deals. I find it very exciting. 
like in a perfect world, I wouldn't ever again be doing consultation agreements with government or industry. I keep saying that's so 2004, but we're not there yet. But the more we can just talk about business as business between equals, I think that's very exciting. And there's a lot of upside for everyone. Agreed, agreed. Well, thank you so much, Bob, um, for sharing some of your time and wisdom and energy with us today. And thank you for the work that you've been doing in our communities for over 30 years and the work that your company continues to lead, um, which sounds uh, very progressive and and moving and shifting the dial in, in the way that, you know, I think it needs to move. Um, equity discussions, centering relationships, um, you know, you, you talk about like connecting as human. So bringing our humanity in, um, you know, relationship protocols and agreements and, and, you know, being able to, to really move from, you know, an old archaic way of just straight consultation to, uh, really being progressive in, in how we view not only our views, but the, the business practices that we're, we're implementing. So I really appreciate um, you being open to coming today and, and sharing your wisdom with us, as well as you, you and your company's sponsorship of what we're up to here with the Indigenous Business Magazine and elevating um, our stories and our voices. It's uh, companies and people like you uh, that are supporting that movement that we're able to be here today. So Thank you so much. I raise my hands to you um, in gratitude. Well, and thank you for giving me and my firm these opportunities. Uh, I've really enjoyed this and onward and upward, I would say. For sure. So thanks everyone for tuning in today um, and uh, make sure to uh, read our fourth publication of Makuk P. Salem, the Indigenous Business Magazine of Business in Vancouver. Uh, my name is Chastity Davis Alphonse and uh, recording today from the beautiful Sequetmic territories and wishing you all well, all my relations. <laughs>